<laughs> That's okay. Well, you read my writing. <laughs> you know that. That's okay. I get much past uh, 12, and I have to take my shoes off to count. So. Yeah. Okay, it is Friday, July 18th. I'm Steve Brown. I'm here with the Cantini First Division Oral History Project. We're in Hudson, Ohio, and I'm speaking with Mr. Ted Mathias. Mr. Mathias, can you spell your last name, please? M-A-T-H-I-E-S. And I should add something I failed to add. We get to the point where we're at an hour, Sam's going to touch me on the shoulder. At that point, I'll bring what we're doing. I'll bring it down to a close. We'll pause momentarily, put in a new tape, and then I'll give that introduction again so we can splice everything together. So, where were you born, Mr. Matthias? I was born in Akron, Ohio, about 20 miles south of where we're at here. Uh, went to school in uh, Calga Falls, Ohio, which is uh, about four miles north of Akron and uh, stayed in Cuyahoga Falls all of my life. Uh, in fact, I worked uh, right down the street from here uh, when I was drafted. I was a welder repairman for Massey Ferguson. In 1968, uh, I received a draft notice, went up to Cleveland, and uh, failed the physical because my sugar level was high. So they sent me home, and I figured, well, that's the end of that. And then. Another letter in 69, they say, well, let's go check your sugar again, and, and it was fine. And uh, so I went up for a trip that I thought they'd be sending me back home, and uh, uh, I ended up in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and uh, in a training center down there, and uh, started basic down there, only did uh, partial basic. They were short, if, the, if I remember the number correctly, about 4,000 medics when I went in. And we had abbreviated basic training. There was 15 of us sent to uh, San Antonio, Texas uh, to start medical training center. And uh, they shipped us out the uh, week before Christmas, got us to San Antonio the day before Christmas leave starts and with no transportation on the way out and uh, no training starting until February. <laughs> so uh, got a Christmas leave and in 1968 returned back to Fort Sam, Houston and uh, had to finish my basic there. Rifle training, escape and evasion were the only two courses they uh, had to have fulfilled since they cut us short at uh, uh, Fort Campbell and uh, Fort Sam was not what I was what I expected it was wasn't at all like Fort Campbell uh, Fort Campbell if they didn't like the way you made your bed you you found it in front of the barracks that night and uh, Fort Sam they would kind of fold the corner of the bed over uh, it was a much lax atmosphere than what I understand the the infantry had we concentrated on medical training. We had homework each night. And as I remember, we only had one barracks inspection, IG inspection. But we spent most of the time on the books. Our names were posted to go to Vietnam when we got there, so there was no questioning, you know, where are we going. And uh, so that's how I became a medic was they were short medics, and uh, somehow I was selected at uh, Fort Campbell along with 12 or 13 others. Uh, I was put in charge of getting everybody to Fort Sam from uh, uh, Fort Campbell and uh, lost one on the way in Dallas. He missed a plane. So I was hoping that was not an omen. Uh, so uh, From there, we had 10 weeks of training, and I believe that might have even been cut short to, to nine weeks to, to get some medics in country. Uh, uh, we took the full the full ten week training. It was just uh, uh, compressed in a. I, I think for some reason my memory tells me it was a compressed time frame. And uh, 
we did uh, all the training for hospitals. We did making beds, giving baths. We we gave uh, uh, we practiced starting IVs on one another. We practice uh, uh, giving shots on one another. We paired up with partners when we started, and we kept the same partner through training. And uh, uh, Clarence Brown, who was my partner, I believe, received three Purple Hearts in training. Uh, and uh, he was an excellent guy to work with. Uh, we, we learned to suture on sponges. Uh, they wouldn't allow us to practice uh, tracheotomies. We did uh, escape and evasion with stretchers. We did the uh, uh, loading helicopters. And we had one week of combat medicine. And from there, I shipped uh, over to Vietnam to the 90th Replacement Center, which is about the hottest place that I know of. And uh, my first meal in country as I walked into the mess tent, which had about an eight-foot ceiling, was about 230 degrees and full of flies. And I threw my food in the trash can at the end of the line, thinking, I, I don't have to eat this stuff. You know, Tomorrow was a different day. And uh, I did learn to eat the food. Uh, I stayed there for a couple of days. And every morning, we would line up. And they would call out first local, which was the area that we were in. And I'd been in Vietnam and all I'd heard about it, three days, I hadn't heard a shot fired and uh, felt relatively safe. And on the third day, they called local Matthias, Ted S. And I'm going, yes, local. And they said, 82nd Airborne. I said, oh no. And uh, so my spirits peaked and dipped in uh, a second and a half, and uh, I was shipped then to uh, Fuloy and then on down to Tonsonuk. Fuloy, I did P training or preparatory training where you, you spend a week uh, learning about Vietnam, and uh, then I was assigned to the uh, uh, first of the 505th headquarters, headquarters company, and then attached to Bravo Company, uh, first of the 505th infantry. And uh, I served with the 82nd until their pullout in November. And then I was reassigned to the 1st Infantry Division, 2nd of the 18th Infantry, uh, and attached to Bravo Company, uh, and back in the field as a field medic working with the infantry. That's, uh, well, what kind of family, what was your family life like before you? I was fortunate, and I didn't have a serious girlfriend to be constantly uh, writing letters or, or to have my, my focus there. Uh, family wrote every day. In fact, they sent me a tape recorder so we could actually tape back and forth when, when that was available. When, when, tell me about your family. Uh, I came from a family of seven, and uh, my dad was an auto repairman, uh, body shop. Uh, my mother worked as a beautician, and uh, I'm the second oldest. So my brother, my older brother was in college, and uh, my younger brothers and sisters were uh, still in uh, high school and grade school when I went to Vietnam. Had anybody in your family, extended family, immediate family, had military service before you went? No. So you're the first one to go? First one in the immediate family, yeah. How did your family respond when you got the notice, especially given that the first time through you, your sugar was too high? How did everybody respond when they found out you were headed to the service? Uh, the, when I was sent back, everybody was relieved. And uh, when I went up the second time, you know, everybody's thinking, well, you know, probably have the same problem, get sent back, and uh, that didn't happen. so. Uh, when I called from Cleveland, I said, I'm on, my way to, I'm on my way to get on a bus to go to Fort Knox. You mean you left straight? You had that second test, and then you left straight from there for Fort Knox? That's correct. So, uh, what was the response at the other end? Uh, oh, my. I mean, it was pretty low, and 
I always tried to uh, keep an upbeat on things, and uh, you know, I I told mom, you know, there's there's a lot of jobs in the service, you know, uh, I don't even know that I'm going to Vietnam. Okay, and then when I did find out I was going to Vietnam, after I got let me let me ask you, sir, when did you find out that you were going to be sent to medic training? Uh, about the fourth week of basic training. Do you know why you were selected for medic training? Nope. Okay. So. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were yeah, talking yeah. to your mom about various jobs, and then you, the, when did you find out you were headed for Vietnam? Uh, the day that I got, the day before Christmas when I got to uh, Fort Sam, they have a posting board with names on it of people who are slated to go to Vietnam and those who were slated to go to Germany and, and so on and so forth. They were called alerts. They weren't, they weren't absolutes. And uh, <coughs> everybody was going to Vietnam except for four going to Germany. So, but what did you think when you saw that? I pretty much assumed it myself, uh, hearing what was going on at uh, uh, Fort Campbell, and uh, I wasn't surprised, okay. Uh, I didn't tell my mom at that time or anybody in the family at that time. In fact, that I didn't notify them that I started giving them hints that it looked like I'm going to end up in Vietnam, probably started in, in uh, late January or February, and uh, just slowly let some comments out. And, and then, again, trying to keep an, up, an upbeat on that, that I could be in a hospital, I could be anywhere, uh, and I had no clue. Most of my training was all for hospital. Like I say, we only received one week of, of combat training. So at that point, I really had no idea. Uh, in fact, I had no idea until that morning at the uh, uh, 90th replacement where I might serve. Okay. Uh, and when I found out the uh, uh, that I would be with the 1st of the 505th Infantry, I had a pretty good idea that, uh, well, I might get a rear aid station or a forward aid station or a field, you know. So still keeping it upbeat. And in fact, I told uh, the letters that I wrote home had return address of headquarters, headquarters company, 1st uh, of the 505th. And I returned, even in the field, I sent all my mail out in those envelopes. And one day the mail got wet and the company clerk for Bravo Company had to put new envelopes on everything and readdress them with Bravo Company return address on the envelope. And then I got a nasty letter. <laughs> hmm. well, <So>. what, <laughs> what was nasty about it? Well, they found out I was in the field, I was not in the rear. Uh, how long had you been in the field at that point? Uh, about two and a half months. What did they think about that? Uh, well, uh, they were upset that I didn't mention it. They were upset that, that uh, you know, I didn't mislead them. I just didn't tell them where I was. And uh, Why didn't you? I just didn't want to upset them. Because so, uh, I, I knew my mom would... Uh, spend all day and all night worrying about it. So, and I just didn't want to do that. And then in most of the letters I did, uh, I put a spin on it uh, to, to the positive side as not to, not to worry them as to what we were involved with or types of casualties I was dealing with. And uh, it caught up with me later when the, the total of the war stacks up on you, and you have to vent. But uh, so, but I did what I could to to keep their mind at rest as as much as I could. Uh, what was your first impression of Vietnam? As I looked out the window of the airplane, and all of these thoughts of Vietnam as you're making your approach in, and we come to a stop on the tarmac, and I look outside, and there's a tug, and a soldier sitting there with his feet up on the steering wheel and a can of Coke. Mm -hmm. 
it gave me some mixed mixed emotions and and uh, the 90th uh, replacement Ben Waugh and Long Ben at that time uh, in in early 69 not in May of 69 uh, the Ted is behind him things have calmed down so it was fairly quiet and not at all what I expected uh, as going into combat so uh, it wasn't until a week later at Tonsonuk when uh, three rockets came in from the perimeter. Okay. Uh, and Tonsonuk is an Air Force base. Yes, right? Tonsonuk is the Air Force base uh, on the north side of Saigon. And the 82nd had their bases on the west side where the perimeter had got overrun at the Tet. And the 82nd was assigned security of Saigon was his primary mission and uh, so that's why their barracks were there and uh, the 505th in particular worked the west side and close to the the uh, perimeter of uh, Saigon there were there were other first of the 508th of the airborne was in there as well and uh, it was fairly small unit as I found out after going to the first infantry division Okay. What was involved in the one week of combat medical training that you received? Uh, how to move casualties, how to load casualties, uh, how to treat uh, more massive wounds, uh, some psychology on not letting all of the wounds not to let all of the wounds get to you. You treat one wound at a time. You know, it doesn't matter how many wounded you have or how many wounds one person has. Uh, splinting, uh, things that you might want to carry in your aid bag, and, and more personal experiences from the instructors at that point rather, rather than from textbooks because we had some instructors who were medics in, in Vietnam. And, uh, which was somewhat helpful. It still was not any way close to being to prepare you for the field. Why would they teach you just concentrate on one wound at a time, one soldier at a time? Not, not, to, not to necessarily concentrate on one soldier because you can't do that, but not to be overwhelmed okay. by the number of wounds Okay, uh, you know, you, you, you do your triage, you make your assessment, you, you, you do your treatment, and, and whether somebody has one wound or five wounds, okay, don't, you, you don't let that affect you. And, and to, for me, it wasn't a large learning curve. Uh, uh, what, what was the most difficult routine to get down, if you would, is, is and most, most of our injuries were caused from mines. I believe there were uh, 39,000 uh, soldiers killed by mines in, in Vietnam, and it, was, it wasn't an everyday occurrence, but you expected it every minute, and you knew from a mine you were going to have three to four casualties. You knew exactly what the wounds were going to be, and you prepared yourself. And learning to quickly look at all of the wounded, okay, uh, to find your worst, okay, and to get that treatment started, to get help to help you, and then move on to the next one. And you just keep making your rounds uh, three or four times around to all the wounded, uh, improving the treatment. Uh, taking care of minor wounds on the second second trip around and learning that routine kind of helped me uh, even in the firefights uh, in, in dealing with wounds and, and uh, it, it's difficult to uh, put a bandage on someone's uh, on their leg for example and say hold this I'll be back and you've got to go check on the other guy because you don't know if he's better or worse and then you come back, okay? And that's, that's what you constantly do. You're making your rounds, uh, 
triage is quick. I mean, you don't have a lot to work with. And learning to pack and experience uh, of what to get rid of in your aid bag and, and what to pack, what you needed more of, and what supplies you needed uh, a lot of. Uh, that, that was a learning curve that took a while because uh, a firefight with uh, gunshot wounds is, is different treatment versus uh, hitting two or three mines in one morning. Okay? Uh, it, it, it's an awesome amount of supplies that you need to try and do uh, uh, what it is you need to do. And learning that, that a, a method of triage so you can get around to everybody and, and uh, take care of the wounded. And fortunately, in every case that I remember, uh, the infantry guys would be there to help without question. Okay? You rarely ever had to call for help. They would be there, and if you said do this, they would do that and then you move on. And in some cases, I, uh, as they learned, when I got to the second or the third wounded, they had already started treatment. And that's, that's, how, it, that's how it works. How does one medic take care of eight wounded in a battlefield uh, and stop the bleeding? Uh, that's how it happens, it's, it's everybody. So. Let me ask you this, you mentioned mine wounds and gunshot wounds. You hear a mine go yes. off. What are you anticipating treating? I, an I anticipate that I'm going to have uh, uh, someone with traumatic amputation, the worst case. I expect that I'm going to have someone... Amputation of? From the knees down. Uh, How are you going to deal with that? Uh, with tourniquets. And, and speed. Uh, it depends on, there, there's a lot of things on mines that, that impact the wound. If it's buried in hard ground, if it's been there a long time, it, it has a different impact. If the soldier was running or walking has a big impact on it, how far apart they're spread out. Uh, but I, it, the other thing you have to deal with is that you have some concussion from this mine as well, okay? And you have the smoke, okay? And the, the, the first time you don't know what to expect. You've seen it in the books, you've seen it in the movies, and people have told you about it, and uh, you, you, you just live it. It seems like every second is, is an hour, and your training kicks in. You know what you have to do, okay? You don't think, I thought, you know, the blood is going to bother me, and it did not, okay? It did later, after the incident, the, uh, the types of wounds. But in treating the wound, it, it was what I was trained to do, and that's, that's, what, I, uh, that's what I did. Uh, but after three or four mines, you, you would hear the mine go off, uh, I was normally with the uh, uh, RTOs and the platoon leaders that put me about two-thirds of the way up. What does so, RTO stand for? Uh, radio telephone operator. So the radio man. The radio man. Okay. And uh, the platoon leader, we normally worked in two, two platoons, mostly separate, but in close proximity of one another. And we would be spaced from the point man who would, would lead the uh, uh, mission, we were probably five or six soldiers back, and that's usually where the mines were hit in, in the first four or five guys, so it's fairly close. You would have some concussion, and maybe it wasn't all bad because it, it kind of deadens your senses, you know, your ears are ringing, and you learned that you had to get there quickly because on an amputation, the, the uh, uh, arteries and, and the veins will, will contract and you have a couple of minutes that you don't have any bleeding. You also have a couple of minutes that your casualty is, is unconscious 
and it gives you time to do the treatment that you need to do, but you have to get, you have to literally run there. Uh, you don't know, you think it's a mine, you really don't know, but you have to run when everybody else is backing up. And because you know you only have a few minutes. And the, the harder wounds to treat from a mine were the uh, man behind him is going to have face wounds and the man in front of him is going to have wounds to the back of his head. And head wounds are extremely difficult uh, to control bleeding because you just can't apply pressure. Uh, you can't put a tourniquet. Uh, so they're, they're very difficult and uh, sometimes it'll involve four people. I think five was the most that I ever had for one, for one mine. So, and one has been the least. So. When was the first time you had to treat a wounded man? How long did you do <coughs> with the 82nd Airborne? Yes. I have to answer that with, uh, uh, with two. Uh, we were working, uh, I believe, up towards the Iron Triangle and I had uh, some soldiers with some shrapnel wounds from a booby trap. Very, very minor. Very little bleeding. The Band-Aid kind of wound, if, if you would. And that, that was, to some degree, first blood for me. Uh, three or four days after that, I'd been in the field about maybe three weeks or four weeks, we returned to Firebase All-America too. And I woke up one morning at 7 in the morning and I looked to my left and I saw a bunker and I saw the guy sitting on top of the bunker on the perimeter. I looked over to the uh, mess hall and there was about 40 people in line. And just about that instant, there was an explosion that just about knocked me over. And uh, there were six, six to nine claymores had blown up under the guy sitting on the bunker. And I had just gotten up. I didn't have my boots on. I was trying to get a boot on. I got one boot on. I couldn't get the other boot on. And, and uh, I know time is a, of the essence. And I just grabbed my aid bag and one boot. And I ran over to the bunker. And uh, I just started treating the, the first wounded man that I came to was, was unconscious. and. Uh, rolled him over and he was breathing, but I knew running up to him that he had uh, pretty severe leg wounds. And How did the, these were your own claymores that went off? Yes. Do you know? Not to this day, I do not know. Uh, every morning the claymores, the, the claymore mines that were placed out in, in the front of the bunkers were uh, disarmed, the, the uh, dead cord that connects them and the blasting caps that arm them. Are debt removed. cord, debt means detonation cord. That's correct. And uh, they're all supposed to be removed in the morning, and they do that just after daylight. And that apparently was done, and the claymores were stacked up outside. Uh, and I, I never did find it, find out any information on how they went off. So you're working on this guy with a pretty severe leg wound, right? And I've got one one leg done, and uh, someone give hollers. Put a tourniquet on it. Uh, you say not done. Uh, what, you, what have you done? Okay. What the when I arrived in Vietnam uh, at the 82nd to the rear aid station, there was a medic there by the name of John Nips, who was a, uh, an E5, had been there maybe a tour, maybe longer. What rank were you at this point? I was a... Uh, E4? E4, yes. And he issued me my aid bag, and he took it out of the box. It's brand new M5 aid bag, which is about 12 by 18 inches square, airborne aid bag. And he unzips it, and he dumps it out over my bed. And he says, you're not going to need that for sick people. He says, this is how you want to pack, and this is the types of wounds you're going to treat. So I had a heads up that what I needed 
uh, to treat the wounded was a lot of four by four gauze pads and a lot of ACE bandages. And if I had those two items, I could take care of just about anything in the field. What about morphine? I carried morphine and I was reluctant to use it. It would slow down your treatment uh, depending on how far we were away from a, an evac hospital or uh, how quick the medevacs were coming in. Okay. If I had a delayed medevac and someone was in a lot of pain, I would use the morphine. If I was expecting uh, a medevac in five or ten minutes and from the time that the injury occurred to get to the evac hospital could be less than 30 minutes. If I used morphine, uh, you might not be able to go to surgery until the morphine wears off. So I was reluctant to use morphine uh, in spite of a lot of the, the troops I had with me. Uh, but when things were delayed, we did. Uh, so I carried six surrettes. They were inventoried every time I went to the rear and accounted for and signed off. And uh, every time I changed units, they had to be inventoried and they had to be signed off. You ever lose surrettes in the field? I used two on, on the last mission with the 82nd. And uh, I did not have a field medical tag. I did not remember the names. Okay, And the uh, whole rear area is being shut down. And there was a, a doctor there, a battalion surgeon, and he signed off on my two surrettes, and that was, that was as much aggravation other than having to report, show the surrettes, and they had to be inspected to make sure that they were full because there was, there was a lot of uh, morphine loss, uh, apparently. What was the concern about that? Uh, that it would be used for non-medical reasons. Um, to get high? Yes. Okay. The morphine at that time was was packaged in a zinc tube and had a long needle on it. And apparently, uh, I don't know anybody that did this, but apparently what was happening is someone could stick a syringe through the package into the syrette and take out the morphine and the zinc tube would still be inflated. It would appear to be inflated, mm -hmm. although it would be empty. So, and that was a new rule that started in about July of 1969. There were a lot of medical rules that went into place in July of 69. Uh, no weapons on a medevac with the, with the wounded. Uh, so there, there was, there was uh, uh, some evolution of, of rules going on. So, uh, so anyway, the, to, back to your original question, uh, that my first real blood was, was at the fire base with five wounded and uh, uh, even though I had some minor shrapnel wounds before that, uh, uh, and, and that haunts me to this day of being almost the worst scenario that, that I had to go through is five, five wounded at one time. And, uh, Did they all make it? All but one. Uh, one died on the medevac on the uh, way to La Caye. What kind of wounds did he have? A uh, traumatic amputation of uh, both legs. From these uh, claymores? From the claymore mines. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you whether they were po pointing up or down. They were sitting on the edge of the bunker with their feet hanging off. And all I, obviously all I had were uh, uh, leg wounds because they were sitting on top of sandbags, which were placed on top of steel sheeting. And the claymore, when the, just so that Everybody understands. How does the claymore work? Claymore is a uh, uh, convex device that has 750 uh, steel bearings in the front of it, and it has a pad of uh, C4 explosive behind it. Uh, you place it out uh, 100 feet in front of your position. The back blast of a claymore is, is 65 feet. So if you just set one in front of you at 30 feet, uh, the plastic in a back blast would, would probably kill you. Uh, certainly the concussion would. Uh, but it would, it, it would send out 
these steel bearings in a, in a fanning shape, and uh, uh, it was very dec decimating to the enemy. Uh, so it was uh, by far the, probably the worst uh, mine that we have over there. So. Speaking of the enemy, Yes. Did you ever ever have occasion to treat Vietnamese wounded? Once, uh, I treated uh, a captured uh, VC after a firefight who was shot in the leg, and uh, treated his leg. And uh, as treating the enemy, uh, that was the only case I had. Uh, villagers are, are another story. What was it like treating that Vietnamese? Was it Viet Cong or NVA or? It was uh, Viet Cong. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate with both the units that I served with, and I say this. Um, the guys had their heads on. Uh, there was not a, a great, huge animosity. Uh, as some units had, and uh, you know, we had a mission: take this bunker, take this hill, patrol here, and we we did our job. We did our mission. We had no grudge to take out on the enemy, and the attitude was, was just different than a lot of units. And I was lucky enough to serve in two units that that had very good attitudes. And uh, you know, once the VC surrendered. Uh, they were they were prisoners, and uh, they were treated well. So, uh, okay. They, uh, you know they would fly them out, and we wouldn't see them anymore. Uh, they would fly them to the rear. Uh, we had taken prisoners before, and uh, but if they weren't wounded, uh, I, I had no interest in them. Uh, I had other things to do constantly, uh, keeping keeping an eye on other things. Uh, but that is the one case that uh, that I did treat the, uh, the VC. So. Okay. Let's to go back then to your time with the 82nd. How long did you remain with the 82nd? I was I served with the 82nd for seven months. Okay. okay. From May until the end of November. And then you were reassigned uh, to the to first, first. Yes, I. Uh, I was told that with the amount of time that when, when the 82nd pulled out and I was told that I had enough, I had already served enough time in the field and that I would be going to see Med and Lock Hay with the 1st Infantry Division, and which made me feel pretty good. Uh, when I got to the 1st uh, of Men with the 1st Infantry Division, uh, I was informed that I was outranked, and I was assigned to the second of the 18th and infantry. And I already knew what that was going to be like. And I says, "Don't you have anything else?" And he says, "We have an opening with the 57th Med and the 68th Med." Well, I already knew those were medevac companies. I already knew what medics, crew chiefs did on medevacs, and I. I really didn't want that job. What did they do? Uh, they treated the wounded on the helicopters. They were the uh, uh, flew on the helicopters when they would come in to pick up the wounded, uh, uh, whether it be a hot LZ or a cold LZ. And the difference there is a, a hot L LZ. LZ stands for a landing zone. Uh, most of the landing zones were very hazardous for a helicopter to get into on a, on a clear day. Sometimes they were being shot at or rocketed. We've had medevac shot down. Uh, they have to sit there until the wounded are loaded and IVs are checked that nothing got pulled out in the, in the process. Sometimes the, there is no medical treatment. Uh, the wounded are just loaded on a helicopter, and the crew chief then has to treat the wounds in flight. And uh, uh, the survival rate of, of crew chiefs and, and uh, medics on the medevacs was, was uh, extremely low. And I, I knew that 
I, uh, from medevacs that I had loaded in the field. I wanted no part of their job. But I talked myself into going over to the uh, flight line to the 57th, and I walked into their headquarters, and they looked at me like fresh meat and uh, talked to them for a while, and I went out, and there was a medic cleaning a uh, uh, helicopter on the flight line, and I went out and talked to him for a while and almost talked myself into uh, signing on and knowing this is a bad job, and I noticed on the back bulkhead of the helicopter were hash marks. And I says, what are the hash marks for? And he said, those are babies that I've delivered in flight. So I went back to First Men and took my papers for the second of the 18th. <laughs> so you didn't want to be birthing no I, babies. No, huh? no, I was worried about the wounded. I had not given any any thought to uh, delivering babies, even though that was part of our training at Fort Sam. Uh, it's one of those things. Yeah, they're training us for this, but uh, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, wrong. So. But later I'd find out that not only did I use everything I learned at Fort Sam, but uh, I used everything I learned from the third grade. So uh, I, I pay much more attention now <laughs> as to what I might need. So. What was it like when you got to the first division? It was, it was tough. Uh, the, the members from the 82nd, there were, we were in a convoy of about 15 or 20 deuce and a halves that went to Fuloy. So there was quite a few of us that didn't have enough time to rotate. And even though we had spent, been in Vietnam, we were required to go through their P training again. P training is? Which is preparatory training to learn how to live in Vietnam and which we did when we went into the 82nd. Let me ask you this. When you're down in the 82nd, you're on the outside of the perimeter of Saigon, correct? That's correct. What's the topography around that area like compared to what it is when you go up to Phu Loi? Uh, on the west side of Saigon, it's more flat. It's more uh, starts getting wet. And the further west you go, you get into the what, what was referred to as the pineapples or the plain of reeds. It's a lot of rice paddies. It's not delta. It's not like you hear about in the south, but it's wet. The further north you go, you get more rolling hills, uh, drier conditions. Uh, you get a mix of jungle and dense wood. Uh, Around Saigon, one big industry would be logging okay, uh, as civilian occupation to, to give you the terrain. And, uh, so. so you moved up, when you moved up with 1st Division, you moved into heavier jungle fighting? Yes. Well, as it, as it turns out, the, uh, with the 82nd, we, we worked uh, three primary areas of operation. And to the north would be the Iron Triangle. Mm. In, the, in the center, or, or between Saigon and the Iron Triangle, was Thunder Road. Okay. We worked about 40 miles of Thunder Road uh, up, past, up north of Chulai. And then we also worked south in an area south of the Parrot's Beak, which is a, where Cambodia jolts out, if you would. And it was also called the, the Plain of Reeds, and it was wetter down there. That's P-L-A-I-N, Plain of Reeds? Yes. Okay. And so those, there were probably other areas, but it, I can only judge from terrain. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I could have been 100 miles off if it had the same terrain, okay, as the pineapples did. That To me, that's where I was because you really had no sense of exactly where you were, except uh, uh, when you worked Thunder Road, on and off of Thunder Road, you, uh, which you didn't want to do. You had Cambodia on one side, and you had the Iron Triangle on the other side, and the, uh, the Iron Triangle is where the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail ends. 
and uh, very difficult. Uh, Iron Triangle itself is full of deep ravines, heavy woods, jungle, uh, slow to go. Uh, uh, outside of fire support, which would mean that if we needed artillery, we were too far away. If we needed uh, air support, we were a long time getting it because we were too far away. So, uh, and the, those, almost all of the areas that we worked, we fell into that on, on the far reaches of uh, west side of Saigon towards Cambodia because there were not sufficient fire bases to, to fire artillery support. So a lot of times you were on your own, you waited for air support or you waited for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, was, it was grab what you could get. And, Things improved with the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, the 82nd is an airborne unit. Uh, they did not have a lot of logistics. They didn't have big truck battalions. They didn't have big chopper uh, battalions. And they borrowed trucks from other units to move troops. They borrowed helicopters. And we always kind of fell in on the end of the line, if you would, sometimes. If we were trying to get fire support, if I were with the 82nd and we were trying to get fire support, say, from a fire base uh, artillery uh, from the 1st Infantry Division, okay, I would, we would probably fall in somewhere under uh, the 1st Infantry's uh, uh, hot fire uh, missions that they would have. Uh, going to the 1st Infantry Division, we have big PXs, and we have barracks, and we have trucks. What's a PD, uh, PX? Yeah, Post Exchange, and that's uh, the local store where you could uh, go in and get a sandwich or buy personal effects. Uh, so it's just the, uh, they had been there longer. They were more established, uh, much bigger division, and we, we just enormous amount of support then. Uh, whatever you needed, we had plenty of. Uh, in the 82nd, you know, we got what we needed, okay, but, but there were no frills, there, there were no extras, and, and uh, basically what you had on your back was all you were going to get. Uh, medical supplies in, in either division, uh, the medics in the rear would get me anything I needed in two hours. I don't remember waiting longer than that. Uh, I waited longer than that for food and water, okay, but not for medical supplies. So, uh, if I got on, a, on if I got on a radio, whatever I requested, uh, somehow by some helicopter, got there when I needed it. So, and that's uh, uh, a big advantage that uh, I think Vietnam medics had over uh, all the previous wars. So, okay. Uh, um, you arrived at Fuloy in November? That's correct. Did you get R&R &R before you, before that, or? No. Okay. No. Uh, the only R&R, &R, if you would, was the three or four days that we had for the preparatory training, uh, which was at a, a secured area of Fuloy. It was separated because they're usually bringing troops in that, you know, that's their first day in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, it was a, a lot quieter than we were used to. And being treated like uh, people that, that just came in country kind of rubbed everybody the wrong way uh, and, until we were dispatched out to our units. So. You had a, an incident that occurred sometime around Thanksgiving Day, didn't you? Yes. What was that? Uh, in Thanksgiving, uh, we were given a mission to uh, resecure uh, Thunder Four, which was a fire base off of Thunder Road, and it was the first mission I was with for the First Infantry Division. And they trucked us up Highway 13 within 500 meters or so of the fire base, and, and uh, we got off the trucks. And we patrolled into a fire base that had, been, that had been closed for a long time. In fact, the grass and the weeds had grown up nearly as tall as the bunkers. And 
we went through, we swept, secured the area without incident, and we were assigned bunkers. And so we're settling in for the night, and it's, it's a pretty bright moon out. And the, of course, the infantrymen have put out their uh, Claymore mines and their trip flares, and guard duty has all been assigned to everybody. And I don't know, it's probably 10 o'clock or a little well after dark. Uh, trip flares start going off, and of course we set off the claymores, and then, then we're firing the area up, and there's no VC, there's no return fire, and it's just like a panic attack, and things quieten down, and then the trip flares go off again out on the perimeter, and it gets all fired up, and another panic attack, and we're trying to figure out what's going on, no return fire, uh, you know, what's setting the trip flares off. And I was sitting in the bunker looking out the door because it's a bright moon and there's a rat about the size of a groundhog. Except there's hundreds of rats. And we spent the night shooting rats and keeping them out of the bunkers. And uh, so we were up all night just shooting rats that uh, they were probably that long. And I think I put uh, about 50 to 100 rounds through my 45 that night. Uh, every time it was somebody else's guard duty, they took my 45 because it was e easier to uh, shoot when you're inside the bunker with the 45. Unfortunately, it's louder. <laughs> and they you know, <coughs> made it pretty easy to sleep then? Uh, no, there was no sleep. And uh, about daylight then, the uh, uh, convoy rolled in. Uh, to secure and open the, uh, the fire base. And we were relieved and, and we were given uh, another mission on down uh, Highway 13 to patrol two trails, uh, which, which got complicated. But, uh, but I always remember the night and the rats and, and you know, sometimes you don't know what's worse. Uh, in Vietnam, we, we dealt with monkeys trying to, to get into your camp. We, we dealt with pigs. And, and of course, at night, you only know the trip flare goes off. You have no idea why, and you're not checking IDs. Uh, so it, it was... Uh, Had these rats taken over the, the uh, bunkers after yep. everybody pulled back from that Right. I don't know how long... Base. Yeah, I don't know how long the uh, fire base was closed. I assumed for looking at the shape, it was, it was quite a while, but... They had homesteaded in there, hmm. and uh, what'd you guys do with when you shot the pigs? What'd you do with them? Uh, we left the pigs where usually the if, if a tri if a trip flare goes off, it's immediately followed by a claymore, and there's just not much to pick up. Okay. Uh, I did uh, uh, I did get a pig one night with a with a claymore. Uh, you know, as a medic, I'm, I I always stayed offensive. Okay, it's, it's uh, not my job to assault uh, primarily because I'm usually in the wrong place to do that. Uh, but if I have guard position like any other medic, uh, we will defend that position with whatever it takes. And when, when the trip flare goes off in your position, you open fire, you set your claymores off. Uh, and I got a couple of pigs and they wanted to know what Doc wanted to do with his pigs. Uh, so. And you then, guys didn't eat the pigs? No. no. Why uh, not? Uh, no interest. <laughs> okay. So monkeys, we carried a lot of C4, which is plastic explosives. We used, the, we used explosives to uh, take down trees, to implode bunkers. We would not blow bunkers up. We, they would be a shape charge, and we would actually implode them and fill them up, which would make it harder for the VC and everybody carried C4. We cooked with it. You could take a ball of C4 explosives and roll it into a ball and you stick it on the bottom of your C ration can and light it and uh, it would burn very hot and that's how we cooked. And the side effect of that is it has a very sweet odor and it attracts monkeys. And it's not a place to have monkey trouble. Uh, they would try and get in your backpack wherever it was and of course, it was poisonous to them, but that was kind of a mute point because when you're walking down a trail and a monkey jumps on your back, mm -hmm. trying to get the C4 out of your backpack, 
okay? It doesn't matter whether it's a monkey or a VC at that point, you know. Uh, when you hear a blood-curdling scream and you think somebody's lost their head, you know, it was only a monkey attack. Uh, didn't happen a lot, but it did happen, and, and uh, in certain areas you always had to be aware of uh, having monkey trouble. So, What happened to you the day after Thanksgiving? The day after Thanksgiving was, uh, we had two, the company had two trails to patrol. Uh, they were about a thousand meters apart and they ran west towards Cambodia. And the two platoons split. We actually had a medic with the second platoon. It's the first time I was in a company that had more than one medic. Supposed to have four. Uh, he, this was his first, second day in the field actually. So I stayed with the, I stayed with the second platoon, he was with the first platoon, and they had to go on down uh, a thousand meters further down uh, Highway 13, and then we were to patrol these two roads to the west. We moved into uh, about 500 meters off the road on this trail, and we sit down and start having lunch, uh, waiting for them to get in position. And uh, we got a frantic radio call. They had hit two mines. They had two guys hit two mines. And uh, actually they had, I think, a total of five. Two mines went off. And they had a, uh, a call in for a medevac. And the FDC had advised that the, the, who? the Fire Direction Control Center, who managed our uh, uh, radio traffic at that time, had advised that medevacs were not available at that point. There was none on station. So then a call went out for any helicopter. So knowing, because I already have seven months in the field, what this new medic is going through, or what his wounded are like. And I'm getting a little antsy because I can't get there. A thousand to meters to me is like it's over the hill, okay? Uh, so I asked the, uh, the captain, I said, if somebody will go with me, I said, we'll go down there. He doesn't, medevacs aren't online. Uh, he's got wounded, he's a new medic, he needs some help. And if he has somebody, and he said, well, that's 1,500 meters away. And I said, he needs help. So that's about a mile. Yeah. And uh, so just a few second pause, he said, I'll go with you. We grabbed our gear. We ran back down the road about 500 meters. And by now, it's probably 11 o'clock in the morning. It's about the heat of the day. And we were already soaking wet when we got to, to uh, Highway 13. And we started down Highway 13 running as fast as we could with every step getting slower. And the heat's really taking the effect. And we're down to where we can barely walk. And there was a, a track unit, APCs, had been working on the- Armored personnel carrier. Arm, armored personnel carriers working on the east side. And they saw us running down the road, which is very unusual. So they came out and wanted to know what what was going on and we explained and they said get on so they they ran us down to the trail which saved a lot of time but they wouldn't go down the trail with it being mined so then we ran down that trail with uh, uh, I just remember putting my feet there was it, it's a vehicle trail but the the woods jungle and the weeds are even with the sides of the vehicle I mean it's, it's only that wide and there's a grass strip down the center and I ran keeping my feet on the, on the grass. And uh, why? Uh, I didn't know where the mines were. Uh, I so didn't know if they missed any. Uh, so you figured they didn't put mines in the grass? It, right. Because I I, my thinking at that time was that there's no advantage to put a mine where the wheels of a vehicle aren't going to run. And if you see the grass, it's a good idea somebody hasn't dug it up. Not foolproof. But if you're going to do what you're going to do, I didn't have a lot of options. And that, it, that's about all the forethought I had at that point. Getting to the wounded was what was driving me. 
And uh, so, and I got to a place that had a little clearing, and there were bandages. And a just before I got there, probably about two minutes, there was a loach, which is a light observation helicopter, uh, a very small uh, helicopter had just lifted off. And apparently they had taken the most serious wounded out. And uh, so when I got to the, the clearing, uh, they had set up per, a perimeter guard and I asked where the wounded were and they said just over the hill. And uh, as I got, uh, as I ran over the hill, I saw two guys laying there about six foot apart and they had bandages on them. And a quick look and they, they weren't bleeding. Uh, one had lost most most of both legs, and the other one had severe head wounds. And checking all the vitals and and not sure at that point, you know, why I did all the things I did, and and realizing that okay, I'm, I'm not dealing with bleeding now. Somebody's already taking care of that. So I started IVs on them because the vitals were so bad on the one and uh, talking to the one and trying to explain to him or to reassure him that he was not going to die. Okay. And this is the guy with the head wounds? With the head wounds, at least not while I was there. Okay. And the uh, uh, other wounded was unconscious and he was getting worse. In fact, I started a second IV on that individual and uh, trying to figure out what to do. And, and the, the wounded man with the head wound, I was able to get his backpack under his feet and get it elevated. And, and I couldn't do anything uh, for the other wounded, and, uh, except now wait for the medevac, which, which had already been, been called in. And uh, with everybody being spread out, and I could hear the radio, and I heard the dust off uh, uh, make his inbound request, and nothing was happening. So I uh, popped smoke, which I carried with me, yellow smoke. Uh, I believe that was yellow. And uh, he identified it, and, and uh, I told the guys, let's get him to the helicopter. Well, the helicopter's coming in, it wants to land on the trail because it's the easiest thing to do. And I'm standing about 30 degrees off the trail trying to get him to land in another clearing. He doesn't want to land there. He wants to land on a nice open trail, but I don't know where the, uh, if there are any more mines there. So finally he, he goes over and he lands where I wanted to put him and I ran up and explained to the crew chief, the trail's mined, you know, and then he understood. We got the, the wounded loaded and one of the last things I do when we load the, the wounded on a, on a medevac is I check to make sure the IVs don't get pulled out. And doing so, I bump the head of the wounded with the head wound. And uh, he let out a scream that I could hear over the chopper. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I hadn't, done, I hadn't uh, done that in a very long time. Uh, so, I, Reassured him he's fine. He's still complaining about not getting morphine. And uh, at, at this point where we're at is probably 15 minutes away from second surge in La K. And I don't want to give him any medicine. So, uh, so we got our medevac out and feeling a sign of relief. Uh, then I run into the new medic who was on the other side of the hill setting with some other people. Uh, we had a discussion on the wounded, and I asked him why he didn't stay with the wounded, that we never leave the wounded except for more wounded. Uh, and this is a point then when more track vehicles, find, the track vehicles that wouldn't come down the trail found another way back to where we were, and they had rolled up to the, to the area we were at wanting to know what they could do to help. And uh, the ground starts shaking, and we hear a big engine and uh, it's a M48 or an M60 tank comes rolling down the trail that uh, we had just run down. And he stops and wants to know what he can do to help. And the, uh, 
the captain says he'd like to go further down the trail, but it was uh, uh, there was no room to go around, walk on the edges of the trail. And so the tank commander at that time took his 50 caliber and he raked it up to two sides and another mine went off 150 feet, 100 feet from us. And uh, so then the tank started and moved uh, up to about where the bandages were, not too far from where we were standing, and the tank hit a mine. And for a big tank like that to hit a 20-pound landmine, it just shook the dust off of it. And uh, they had to stop and repair the track at that point. And that's also about where the helicopter was going to land. Okay, can we, we need to hold <coughs> off there. Okay. So, good? Okay, it is Friday, July 18th, 2008. I'm Steve Brown with the Cantini First Division Oral History product, uh, Project. We are with Ted Mathias in Hudson, Ohio, and this is the second uh, tape on this. Now, Mr. Mathias, you were explaining a situation to us um, uh, around Thanksgiving of 1969, Nine. and uh, you guys are evacuating some wounded from an area. Some uh, tracks have come up to help you out. A tank has come up to help you out. You're waiting for a chopper. Can you pick it up and take it from there, please, sir? Uh, after we, we actually received the medevacs, loaded our, our wounded out, and uh, the, the medic with the first platoon showed up. He was with the, uh, some of the guys on the perimeter, and I was uh, asking him why he didn't stay with the wounded. We never leave the wounded except for more wounded. I mean, that's, that's our responsibility. And that's when the tracks had, had shown up, and we ran into the two more mines, as I stated earlier. The captain decided at that point not, because we had been up all night, we'd been up about 30 hours, the wounded were bad, and uh, he decided to consolidate the two platoons back down at the other trail. And so we left there uh, walking back out to uh, Highway 13, and I remember two guys running past me, and as they went by, one of them said, good job, Doc. And that breaks the ice because I was new with the infantry company. And, you know, being called Doc is, is the highest award you get over there. For a medic. For a medic. And that means they have some faith in you and you're able to uh, uh, put back in, into the unit. They've been carrying you all along, and, and they do, okay? And when they need you, you have to be there 150%. And, uh, but we got back to the second platoon, and I was sitting on a log, and, and I have this whole morning going through my mind and, and thinking uh, about the wounded, thinking about the new medic that I should have spent more time with him. Uh, I know how I felt with my first uh, mass casualty situation, if you would. And uh, the last time that I had injured uh, a wounded man when I bent over to work on him and my steel pot fell off and hit him. And steel pot is your it, helmet, Is right? my helmet. And as I, as I bent over to work on him, it fell off and, and uh, hit him and I just have, you know, did I do everything I could do? This is the part uh, that a medic goes through, you know, have you, have you done everything you could do? And th this happens after every scenario. And the uh, captain walks up to me with the uh, battalion radio and he said the battalion commander wants to talk to you. And so I got on the radio and he said he wanted a full report of every wound on every individual and not to leave anything out. And I questioned, are you sure you want to do this? This is something that had never, ever 
been requested or done to my knowledge, and he said affirmative. So he gave me 20 minutes. I got with the other medic to make a list of wounds for the, the ones he had treated and were medevac before I got there, and, and I already knew about the two that I treated. And I sat down and called him back on the radio and went through in detail. I, at first, I had to convert uh, all my wounds to acronyms, okay? Such uh, as? Such as uh, uh, multiple traumatic amputations, which would be MTAs, okay? Multiple frag wounds, which would be uh, MFWs, uh, and, and all the acronyms that we had for different types of wounds. And uh, I went through each man through each wound that I had noted, and it, it was extremely difficult. Even at, at this point, I've probably treated 40 wounded, okay? And since you've been in country. Since I've been in country, and, and uh, I've never once had to, I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the wounds they have. Today, I'm aware of the wounds they have. But to sit down, to put it in a report, uh, and then put it out over the radio was just, it, it was very difficult for, for me to do. Why was that so difficult? Well, apparently they've, and, and I knew this, we were taking a lot of casualties from mines. Yeah, but why was it difficult for you to do that? I don't know. It was just putting it together in, in a, an organized manner, okay? Uh, combat is, is chaos, and it, uh, uh, memories and thoughts come and go, and as you're treating wounded, you're, you're constantly busy, but now all of a sudden you're stopped, you're still, and now you're looking back over this, this, this whole scenario, and you're detailing the wounds. I don't, I have a diff, I can talk about wounded uh, in different situations over there, but I've always had a difficult time detailing wounds. In fact, I, I really don't, can't even do that today. I mean, I can see them, I know what I did, but I can't talk about them. But to sit down and have to, to write it out on a paper and then uh, to talk to a battalion commander about it, uh, it, was just, it was just very difficult for me to do. It, so, okay, so you took this 20 minutes and jotted this stuff down. Yeah. What did you do next? Okay. Uh, after I relayed it over the radio and... Uh, to the battalion commander? To the, to the battalion commander. And I'm sitting there, and, and uh, at this point, I've, you know, I've got tears running down the side of my face, and I'm just uh, bewildered, you know, at this whole scenario, even though I've been here several times. Why? I think one of the reasons that it, that it affected me more is I didn't have the concussion of the minds. It's like doing this when you're sober, okay, because I was a 1,000 meters away. Okay. And I don't have the smoke burning my eyes, my ears aren't ringing, uh, so it, it just bothered me that day. And it, it was somewhat of a turning point in, in uh, understanding uh, the wounded uh, in Vietnam. And, and, uh, Did you ever find out why he wanted you to detail all that? Yes. I asked the captain, you know, what was, I, what was that all about, because it was very unusual. And he said they'd been taking a lot of uh, mine injuries. They wanted it to go out over the battalion radio so that all the companies could hear it to see if it could put some weight for the guys to be careful, pay attention going down trails. You know, uh, so that's that's what was behind it. Uh, even even as difficult as it was for me to do, uh, uh, the report was harder than treating a wounded. I, you sat and you got all done with that exercise, and yeah. you sat down and you cried. Yes. Had you ever cried before after half an attack? Well, cried means you you have a amount of stress and you have tears. Yes. Uh, a couple hours after uh, treating the wounded, the the men expect you to be there when everybody else falls apart with wounded. Okay, it's all clinical to you. It's to the medic. It's all supposed to be clinical. One, two, three. Uh, you know, we're going to do this. Okay, and they don't realize that that we have feelings and, and this has an impact. But you have to suck it up and you hold it together. And several hours later, 
okay? You're just going to sit down and you're going to feel like a bag of bones and, and you just, the adrenaline is gone, you're wiped out, okay? Uh, uh, you could have had a whole array of, of, of wounded and, and that, again, is constantly on your mind. Did I do everything I could do? Did I get there fast enough? I mean, just a whole array of things start coming in your mind. Uh, uh, and, and it bothers you at that point. And, you know, of course, you just, you have to sit there and you have to, to, to be the calm one in the group, okay? Uh, they don't want the medic coming apart uh, and you don't want to come apart. And, and you learn to deal with it, but you still have those same incidents after, after the medevac's gone and after things get quiet and it, the, the adrenaline is just, it, it, it just falls and, and you collapse with it. This, you just said, was a turning point. Yes. Why was it a turning point? Because I, I, I treated wounds, okay? Somebody would get wounded, I would treat the wound, and I would go on to the next wound, okay? And I never personalized the wound to the person. Uh, I never looked at it in, in, a, in a total of the day, in a, in, in a total of the moment. And I had done that, putting this uh, report together. So it's like, gee, now every time something's going to happen, I'm going to have this vision of this report. of. And uh, it, it was also a, a, a stopping point where, you could, where I stopped and reflect uh, on all the wounded I treated. Okay. So in other words, this was exactly the opposite of what you had been trained way back in medic school, correct? Yes. I you mean, are now looking at the big picture and it was overwhelming to you. Yes. Yes. That's that's exactly right. So uh, I had also just uh, <clears throat> at this point in time, this is uh, right about Thanksgiving, I just came out of a situation where we had lost a whole platoon. There were only three of us left. I had 40 wounded in one day and, uh, I'm sorry, 20 wounded in one day and three killed. And I'm already uh, downhill because of that. And then being left in the field, just the three of us. Uh, so my spirits are coming back up and, and a couple of weeks off in the transition between the two units helped quite a bit and now I'm, I, I have this scenario so uh, it's getting to be a uh, not my my normal spirit that that I had come into this with not that you should be cheery and upbeat going into combat okay but you can't let a lot of things drag you down because you have to you have a job to do uh, people depend on you and that's what you have to concentrate on, not not collateral stuff. So, and that's that's what was bothering me at that point. I was, it's like you're beaten down, okay. And now all of a sudden you you, you get up and, and 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 now you get hit again, and uh, uh, and it'll happen again. Uh, so, obviously you have a very stressful job. You're taking care of these wounded. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with the stress? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult. You really, you really don't. Uh, you don't, you say you don't make, you don't make friends in combat, okay? I mean, they, it, it's not a thought. Everybody preaches to you, don't make friends, don't make friends. Well, you do. You help them in a chopper, you help them up a hill, uh, you wake them up for guard duty, you pull their guard duty because they're sick, and, and there's just, you know, you're, you're there. You got your back to their back. You're, you're, a lot of times you're both in a foxhole. You got one side of it and he's got the other side of it. So the, the bonding occurs whether you want to or not, okay? And then uh, even though you might not know their name, you may only know their nickname, uh, and a medic is attached. So when you go to the rear, the medics go back to the aid station the infantry goes to their company area, so it's not, 
Okay, so that helps somewhat with, with the stress. Okay, and then finally, you just come to the realization that you do the best you can do for that time, for that moment. And when you realize that, okay, then, then it, it helps. Okay, uh, the fact that you quit second guessing yourself. Okay, could I have done better? You know, this is the conditions I had to treat this individual under. This is the conditions that, that he had to work in. Okay, maybe different the next time. Uh, and, and keeping those things in mind that given those conditions, this is what I had to work with. This is what I did, and I can't do it over. Uh, I don't have any regrets, uh, with, with the exception of one of any wounded I treated, and, and that was the double check a, a tourniquet that I had put on. Mm -hmm. But there were other medics that could have done it because uh, it was in the fire base, and I kind of wrote it off, but it was, to me, it was my wounded. It was my responsibility. You very much personalized the treatment of this as, as to your responsibility. Yes, yes. It's, it's expected. The uh, infantryman holds a medic up on a pedestal where he does not belong, okay? And uh, they treat you, uh, they guard you, they protect you, okay? Uh, they, they go out of their way to see that a medic has what he needs, okay? Uh, if I were in the rear, for example, and I walked into a, a club and there were guys there from my unit, if I sat down at the table, it would not be unusual for 10 or 15 beers, sodas, or whatever to show up at your table. That's remember me or thanks. And they constantly keep elevating you somewhere. They want you when they need you. So, uh, so you have a certain amount of respect for that, and, and it's, uh, you're trying to do the same job they're doing, okay? You're living in the same environment. You have no more control over your environment than they do, okay? But you're expected to be there. So uh, a lot of times they're overprotective, okay? Uh, especially if you're in a, uh, an area that, that has a lot of enemy activity and, and they're expecting the worst, okay? Uh, you're not, you can't get too close to the front, <laughs> they'll pull you back. Uh, so they like, to, they like to have you right behind them in, in somewhat of a safe spot. But there's a trust that forms that nobody talks about, a bonding uh, that I don't understand, okay? Uh, but uh, they do. They rely on their medic, and, and uh, I, I understand their point, uh, but to me, you know, uh, I was a grunt just like they were. I was doing my job just like they're doing their job. I was no different. Certainly didn't want to be treated special, even though they went out of their way to do that. Uh, sometimes it, it made you feel bad, okay? Uh, medics don't pull guard duty anywhere but you pull guard duty in the, in, in the field because you don't want to be different, okay? Uh, but there were a lot of times they wouldn't let me pull guard duty because you're the medic. You know, we have enough people, is what they would say, uh, and, and things like that. And uh, they, they took very good care of the medic, no question about it. Uh, but at the same time, okay, when you had wounded, okay, the medic was going to be there. And that's what you had to do. And uh, it didn't do stupid things, okay? It did your job, but you, you watched them. You didn't watch the enemy. They watched the enemy. They watched the enemy. They watched you. They watched the RTO on the radio that uh, can't be looking out. Infantryman is, is very, very busy in a firefight. He has a lot of things to, to keep track of. And uh, I have to watch for a wounded. Um, you mentioned going in and sitting down in the club and several beers appearing in mm -hmm. front of you. Was that something you guys did to relieve stress? 
I didn't drink Coke, okay, but I've, yeah. I've never cared for beer, so, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I said earlier that I was blessed to work with two very good units, okay. We had a very good attitude in the two units, and uh, partially because of the people, partially because of the uh, leadership we had, and, but we also did not have a drug problem. Okay, and when I say that, it doesn't mean that there wasn't somebody in the unit that didn't smoke pot, but it, it wasn't a problem. It was what made it not a problem? The men. Okay, if you showed up in the field with drugs, booze, uh, or pot, you were not as likely to make it out of there as the enemy. Okay, and that was a, uh, uh, the group disciplined itself. Did, How did they do that? Uh, by watching everybody, taking it away from you. If, if, if you got a new guy in and uh, he says, and, and you're in the field, and he would pull out some marijuana or something that would get crushed and say, you know, we don't ever want to see that again in the field. It's all business out here. They take any ever, take any more strenuous measures with somebody? Who no. Was, Okay. Never got to be never got to be a problem except with new people coming in. Once they understood the rules, okay, and, and they were the, obviously their army rules, okay. But the the two groups I worked with had had their own uh, code, and there was there was no room for uh, radios or beer or, or pot in the field. Okay. Anybody, for instance, ever fall down the stairs, quote unquote? No, okay. no. Uh, you know what I mean when I'm yep, saying Yep, I know. I know what you're saying. And, and uh, no, there was no mystery injuries. No. There but, have been in other units that I've heard. I don't, I don't know them firsthand, but I've heard of other units with big problems. Now, out in the field. Yes. It was a self-policing policy. Yes. Among the enlisted men. That's correct. What about back at the base? Different story. There were, it was more liberal. Okay, but again, in, in the two groups that I worked with, the, uh, I mean, there was a lot of drinking, as what you would expect, okay? I don't remember uh, a lot of drug use in the two companies I was with, okay? I'm, I'm sure it went on, okay? But I don't remember it ever coming up as an issue. Uh, later on at fire bases, I had to deal with it, and... and uh, I can remember once at uh, Stand Down in Fuloy, and we're sitting around a bunker one night. And of course, what's were, Stand Down? Uh, stand Down is just a two days off, okay. rest up, uh, and we're leaning up against a bunker that's out in front of the barracks, and some of the guys got beers and sodas or whatever, and we're just talking, carrying on, and and. One of the gunners comes by, this M60 gunner, and he's really drunk. You can't even understand what he's saying, and uh, you know, and everybody just sloughs him off, you know, just push him out of the way, and he left. And uh, he went up in the barracks and uh, got his 60 and opened fire on us, and uh, twice he did that, and uh, uh, fortunately he didn't hit anybody, but. Uh, second time somebody come out of the barracks and, and uh, disarmed him, uh, but that that and, and the guys know that's that's why you know combat and and alcohol don't mix. They can be the best guy in the world, but they know, okay, that if you mix alcohol in there, it's 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 an issue. Uh, I had several several uh, incidents with uh, uh, alcohol. Uh, in the 82nd, I had a, a, good, a good friend, if you would, a, another medic. We, we arrived in country about the same time. And I, I don't remember a, a, a time period. It's, it's a couple months later, maybe four months later, and we were in the Airborne Club. And I remember standing uh, against the back wall drinking a Coke and... and uh, they had a Taiwan band playing, and I remember the, the medic getting up and 
shaking his fist at the band, and he left. And not being a big drinker, and, and it was pretty noisy there, so I left. And the aid station was right across the street from the Airborne Club. And I walked in there, and there's another medic with his back against the hallway talking to someone in a room. So I just walked on down the hallway and stopped in the, in the doorway, and the medic had a M16 holding it at the forehead of the other medic until I stepped in the middle. The only difference now is instead of being eight inches away, it's only two inches from my forehead. And we sat there talking to Moore for a long time. I can't tell you if it was 20 minutes or a half an hour. And I find out he's going to go over and kill the drummer for some reason, but he's too much to drink. And So Moore was the guy who's holding the gun or is holding yes. it? Yes, yes. And uh, he's, he's going over and he's, he's going to kill the drummer and we're telling him, no, you're not. And I used to be, I used to remember the number of rifle marks in the flash suppressor on an M16. That's, that's how close it was. And I'm thinking, surely he's not going to shoot me. We're good friends, maybe. Uh, but that, that was my thought, was more talk, trying to talk him out of it. I, I didn't really fear for my life till about a half hour later. But uh, So all the talking that goes on, and he's not budging. And, you know, is it loaded? I know there's a magazine in it. Uh, a deuce and a half pulls up outside. And a deuce a, and a half a is two a... two and a half ton cargo truck that they haul okay. soldiers on. And they threw the tailgate down, and when it went bang, he turned around to look out the window, and uh, I believe the other medic was Phelps. Him and I both jumped on him, and we fell across the bed. And the M16 was in full auto, mm -hmm. and I just remember wood splinters floating in the air as, as we're going down uh, across the bed onto the floor trying to get the magazine out, and the other medic's trying to get his finger off the trigger, and I finally got the magazine out. We had about two rounds left in it, and uh, he, sat up, he sat up on the bed. He put his hands behind him like he was handcuffed, never said another word. We took him down to uh, charge of quarters, CQ, and turned him over to the officer of the day and said this is what he's did, and, and that's the last I heard of that in incident. Did he come back and serve with you the, again? Never heard a word or anything after that. And, okay. uh, and there were several other incidents out at fire bases with, with TRAC people, so alcohol was, was a problem in, in some units. Uh, a moderate problem in some. It, it depends on the... Uh, every unit is different over there, even if they serve side by side. depends on the makeup of the people. The, the toll of their operations they've been on and their leadership. And in both of my units that I served with, the uh, 18th Infantry and the uh, uh, 82nd Airborne, we had very good officers, I think. What makes a good officer in your mind? Uh, having the right blend of getting the mission done, taking care of the people, okay? Not, not a single focus. Uh, we're going out and do the mission, and that's, that's all they see they have blinders on. I was fortunate to have... Uh, uh, officers and, and platoon sergeants who uh, cared about the people. They looked at the mission. We're going to do the mission. We're going to we're going to come back with everybody that we went with. That was that was their goal, and they didn't care about getting medals and and uh, you know. In, in fact, none of the officers or uh, NCOs I worked with. Uh, had a long-term goal beyond that year of being in the military. Okay, so they weren't they weren't like, uh, uh, and they weren't new. I had platoon sergeants that, that had two and a half, working on three years of in Vietnam. Uh, so I and when I say I was blessed with working with two 
two good units, there's a, there's a lot of things that go into to making that work. And, and uh, so I really do uh, uh, think I was very fortunate. So, but I also have no disbelief of things that have gone on in other units because it's real easy to see how the pressure of the, the missions. Uh, people don't realize that in Vietnam an average day for an infantryman is 30 to 35 hours. And then you're going to get four or five hours of sleep and then you're going to be back out. The two units I worked with used the, the same method of operation. We would pull ambush and night patrols at night. Okay, so the most sleep you ever got at night maybe was a, an hour every other hour. You'd get up in the morning, you'd start patrols, you get picked up by helicopters, you go out and do combat assault. Okay, in the evening you were taken to another area and you would have to go out and recon for an amb ambush position, then you'd have to go out after dark and set the ambush position up, or you had a night patrol and it just went on and on and on. So to get, we sleep was anything that's four hours. So uh, somebody questioned me about a lot of pictures they see of Vietnam and they, they see people uh, laying down on the ground, leaning up against a tree or laying on a cot. And you know, it's like they're always laying around, you know. What they don't see, because you don't have your cameras out in combat, is you, you don't realize that they've been up for 30 or 40 hours. Okay. They haven't had any rest for three or four days. And, and you have to be on top of your game. Uh, so there's a lot of stress there. And, and the three day, we worked 14 days out in the field and we came back for three days. 14 days out, three days back. 14 days out, three days back. Both units I worked with had the same, same operation. Did so. you guys have dogs? We worked with some dog units. Uh, no, I mean pets. Oh, no. We, the aid station in the 82nd had two mascots. One was a dog named Band-Aid, and they had a monkey named Morphine. So, uh, what, what do you remember about the dog and the monkey? The, <laughs> the dog was nice. Okay. The monkey, on the other hand, was monkey trouble. He was on a chain. He would sit on the roof above the barracks. And if you tried to go in, he'd grab your hat. If you took your hat off, he'd grab your dog tags. Okay. If he was down on the ground, he'd reach in your pocket and pull something out. And the more you wanted it, the less he was going to let you have it. And uh, he was just a devious little monkey. <laughs> Why do you suppose you guys kept the dog and the monkey around? Uh, they were there when I got there. I, I have no clue. Uh, they, they were only at the, uh, the rear aid station. And uh, uh, I, I don't know how long. Uh, I have a couple pictures of them, and and uh, and I remember their name. The, I definitely remember the monkey. What was the name of the dog? The dog was Band Aid, and the monkey was Morphine. And uh, uh, he he sure was a tyrant, as I remember. So uh, those are the things you sit back and chuckle as some guy spending three hours trying to get his hat back. Or nearly getting choked to death because something's got a hold of your dog tags. <laughs> or somebody reached in your pocket and grabbed your money or your lighter or something. I mean, just faster than a pickpocket. So. You mentioned something earlier about a Bob Hope show. What's your yes. remembrance of that? Uh, uh, I, I'm not quite sure the exact date, but I, I think it was about Thanksgiving, shortly after Thanksgiving. Uh, we went out on a uh, combat assault, and uh, as we're flying into the, uh, into the landing zone, we're flying over, there's, there's rows of trees, and then it looks like a nice green meadows. And then there's a row of trees and green meadows. And, and we're, that's what we're flying over. And then finally we see a couple of gunships circling one of the tree lines and firing it up. And we, we start a 30 degree dive into the, uh, what we expect to be the LZ. We got the Cobras on both sides of us firing rockets into the tree line. And we come in and it, it 
typical uh, uh, height when you get out of a helicopter is, is, is going to be about four feet, three or four feet. They rarely sat down on the ground and they didn't want to stop. But there was this grass and they were at the top of the grass, just above the grass. And the command was given out, 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 and we jumped out. Well, it was mud. And we went, our backpacks is what kept us afloat. Okay, uh, it was just mud. And we're stuck in the mud, our helicopter leaves. And the next helicopter wants to come in to drop guys off, but we're in the landing zone. And it seemed like forever. How deep ever. is the mud? Uh, I never touched the bottom. But like I said, I think it was a backpack. It was thick mud. It wasn't watery. Okay, it was like a clay. So are you up to your chest, your shoulders? About, about up to here, okay. and your your backpack is kind of pushed up above your your head. <coughs> Except for the uh, radio operators, the radio is pretty heavy in it. It stayed in the mud, and uh, so we had some more gunships come in for gunfire or fire support and some gunships. Uh, then the helicopter we came in on came back in, came down low, and we put our arms over the, the rungs, and they started picking the six of us up slowly, and you could hear this sucking sound, and you think your pants are going to be pulled off and your boots, and finally we, they get us up out of that, and they, they get as close to the tree line as they can get, and we drop down on some solid ground. And we smelled like a pig farm. It was the nastiest smell I had ever smelled. And of course, by now the other choppers are coming in and the guys are getting off and now we have all this laughter. And uh, it turned out they, they were, the, the bunkers that we were making an assault on were, were abandoned. And we blew those up, it took us back to the uh, we were supposed to pull ambush out there that night, but they said that some of us smelt so bad they didn't think the VC would come within 3,000 meters. Okay. <laughs> so we went back to a fire base that I had never been to, and uh, I looked for the, the infantry company, went to the perimeter bunkers, and I always go to the aid station, and I found the aid station, and I'm standing outside. And keep in mind, I have no idea where I'm at, what unit. And I've taken my gear off, and I'm laying it on the ground outside the aid station. And I've just taken my pistol belt off and laid it on my aid bag. And I look, and I see this spit shine pair of boots and starch fatigues that you could have probably cut paper on, uh, well-shined lieutenant. And I'm already tired. And he starts with, is that any way to treat your gear, trooper? And I'm about to say something I'm going to regret. And uh, a doctor walks out of the aid station and says to him, says, if you have a problem with my medic, you need to take it up with me. And he said, no, sir, and turned and walked off. And uh, I introduced myself to the doctor that I had never met. And he said, you're having a tough day. <laughs> and I said, yes. He says, the showers are on the other side of the uh, aid station. So I went over there, and there's these long poles, and you can hang 30, 40 buckets. And you fill them up from a water buffalo, which is a tank trailer full of water, and it's got a little sprinkler underneath it. And you, you hang the canvas bag on a nail, and you open it up, and, and the water comes down. And uh, I ripped those clothes off and, and uh, filled that bucket three or four times trying to get that mud and that smell off of me. And I have a, a towel, a green towel, which I always had with me but I have no clothes because we were on a combat assault so we don't, don't carry all of our gear. And uh, so I went in the aid station and nobody had any extra fatigues in there. So I'm going tent to tent looking for some clothes. I got my towel and uh, finally somebody said there's a supply tent and they pointed it out because this is a large fire base and, and like I said, this is, I've never been there before. So I get up there and there's an old sergeant, this is just like in the movies, little short cigar, can of beer, lawn chair, okay? And I'm, I walk up there, and of course he thinks I'm looking pretty funny. And uh, uh, I said, I need some clothes. And he says, what unit are you with? And I said, I'm with the 18th Infantry. He goes, ah, that's not one of my units. 
you know, and he sits there and I said, well, I said, actually, I said, I'm, I'm with headquarters company. I said, I'm a medic and we don't have any forward supply. He goes, oh, medic. And he looks, he says, does that mean you don't have any paperwork? And I said, no. And he says, uh, he says, doc, go in and get anything you need. So I went and got a uh, clean pair of fatigues and uh, uh, I'm barefooted again and looking for a mess hall. And then I had to go clean my gear up. And uh, the next morning we went, we went back out to the similar, same area, different tree line, and we worked ambush and patrols for uh, two or three days. And the captain called me over and he says, he says, uh, get your gear. He says, uh, helicopter's coming in to pick you up. I said, for what? He says, I don't know. So I went and got my gear and still doesn't know anything. The radio operator doesn't know anything. And helicopter comes in and I get on it. I'm the only one on the helicopter. And, and uh, obviously I'm going to the rear and I'm thinking, gee, did somebody die at home? It's some emergency, you know, it's getting pulled out of the field. It's not something that goes on every day. I get to the fire base and I go to the aid station. They got brand new fatigues with all the patches, my name on it, CMB on it, brand new pair of boots, new socks, new everything. And it says, take a shower, get dressed, be at the helipad in an hour. I'm just, What's going on? We don't know. And now I'm really concerned now, you know, I got all these new clothes. And so I take a shower and putting on starch fatigues, okay, and 90 degree weather is, is not the most comfortable thing, but they were clean, okay. And uh, helicopter comes in on the pad, and I run out and get on. There's nobody in the back, nobody to ask, and I'm trying to figure out, you know. Now I'm really getting concerned. What's going on? We come into a, a really large fire base, you know, and I, I don't recognize it. And land, and there's a, a jeep out from the chopper, and a guy comes running up and says, Are you Matthias Ted S? And I said, Yes. He says, Welcome to the Bob Hope USO show. So he gives me a big pass and puts me in the Jeep and takes me to the show and, and obviously he told me how to get back because I did. <laughs> I don't remember that part, but uh, uh, it was at La K and uh, I got to see the Bob Hope show. And uh, then I, next day I'm back in the field and of course nobody's going to believe this story, but I had to pass. <laughs> why, why you? I, I, I don't know how they pick people for the show. Okay, uh, but apparently I was, I was chosen either from headquarters company, which uh, I was assigned to as a medic, or maybe I was picked by Bravo Company, which is the you know I was attached medic there. Uh, I never got any more information on. It's a good show. Who said it was an excellent show? So, and uh, but the effort that the uh, that they went through to get me there was equal to the show when you when. When I stop and, and think back, okay, on them orchestrating this for for one GI in the field is, is just amazing. So. What were things like when you got home? Do you remember when you got home? Yes. Uh, I remember you didn't want to be a GI. Okay. Uh, Why not? I had I had no personal experience <coughs> of of anybody being negative other than nobody wanted to talk about it and uh, newspaper articles and how vets were treated and there was something in the paper maybe twice a week on uh, how vets were treated and, and it was on the news and uh, it was just a, a whole negative thing that I didn't understand. and. Talking to, if you talk to other vets, they, they were experienced the, the, the same thing. Uh, there were stories about vets being spit on, and I think that was, that has pretty much been debunked, but that was the rumor at the time. So it didn't matter whether it was correct or not. That's what the media led you to believe. And it, it just was not popular, okay, uh, to be from Vietnam. And uh, How did that affect you? Uh, it caused you to hold everything in, okay? You, 
you know, uh, we, we go back to what we were talking about with the, you know, the guys think the medics, uh, you know, all clinical and, and you know, it's, it's like a concrete pipe full of, full of jelly, okay, and it, nothing can get in now, nothing can get out, and then you get back home, okay, even though the circumstances have changed, okay, uh, you, you still have this, well, I can't talk about it, and people don't like this, and, and you know, you're just all this apprehension. Uh, so it, it was some trying times, and, and I don't know about all vets, but it's like every everything else I get, I, I learned to deal with it and try and get it behind me and, and move on. Uh, I, was, I worked for Massey Ferguson when I was drafted, and, of course, I went back to work there, and I had, I had no problems at work. And no, nobody any, said anything. Any issues with nightmares or night sweats or anything like that? Uh, I, I've never had any flashbacks. A flashback, as I understand it, is when you really think you're there. I have a lot of reoccurring memories. Uh, in the beginning, noises were, uh, I can remember being home just a few days. I was laying on a couch sleeping, and my mom opened the ironing board and when you open the, the leg, it goes click, 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 and I destroyed a coffee table. Uh, that's about the most physical, but th there was there was probably a year or two where loud noises or sudden things, okay. But uh, I didn't have a lot of reactions that that, that a lot of a lot of veterans have had. Have you yeah. ever you ever talked to anybody about this? Oh yes, yeah. I've talked to other veterans and. and We've shared stories, and, and, and it helps one another to know that we have a lot in common. And, and it goes back to the perspective of looking things, looking at things as a medic versus an infantryman. Okay, I'm not constantly peering into the grass to see if someone's watching me. I don't have that constant fear that they lived with day and night. Okay. Uh, I never got to walk point, so I didn't constantly look for the tripwire. You con you always look for tripwires, and when they were pointed out, you stepped over them because we didn't always dismantle every booby trap we found. We we left it for them. Okay, but I I just didn't have that hundred percent. I didn't have to have that hundred percent focus that the infantry had. Uh, I didn't have that hundred percent. When a uh, when you get ambushed, what do I what do I do with where are they at? Okay, I stayed with the radio telephone operator. When he backed up, when his boots got in my face, I knew I got to back up. Okay, and I stuck to him because my biggest fear over there was getting lost uh, at night because we did a lot of night patrols. And in fact, uh, my replacement was killed two days uh, later. Uh, because not not him, but two guys in front of the uh, radio telephone operator uh, lost a guy in front of him and went left on the trail instead of right, and they walked into their own ambush. Mm. That that devastated me. Uh, I was I was assigned to I was pulled out of the field in in January and assigned to a new fire base, fire base Florida. I believe it was the last fire base that the 1st Infantry Division built and opened, and it was huge. And uh, I was picked to be the senior aid medic uh, at the fire base, and uh, there was another new medic that uh, was with one of the infantry companies. And I remember that night standing around the radio explaining to him the acronyms what's going on in the field and uh, from listening to the radio and, and I heard the call come in, mm. uh, medic down. And the next day, in July, they, they passed some new rules. You cannot put any gear on a medevac, no weapons, no gear, just the wounded. So all the gear, the weapons and everything had to be divvied up among everybody who's left. You had to carry it until a resupply chopper would come in and you could get rid of it. So I had to go out the next morning to the flight pad and wait for the helicopter to bring in his gear. And uh, I think I, after I walked across the, uh, from the helipad over to the aid station, 
I probably stood there and held his gear for, for an hour. Because okay? I would have been right where he was without question. I mean, it's no skill on his part. He's following the guy in front of me. Uh, that's exactly what I would have done. I had done night after night after night after night and for that to happen two days okay, after he replaced me. And then knowing the, the radio operators who were killed, because in, in our mechanical ambushes, there, there are no wounded. Okay? That's, that's the way they're designed. And I think four guys were killed that night. And uh, that probably hurts and bothers me the most. And, and it was probably one of the few medics that uh, I knew better than, than some of the others because we had talked a bit. First, I, I always thought, well, you know, I barely met him, and then after realizing that we had spent, had quite a few conversations together, so that was, that was very tough for about a week. Uh, it, you know, it was like it happened to me. So, uh, so those, those, that's the baggage that, that, that you carry, and, and and I, I'm, I'm like an old farmer. If it's raining on me, it's raining on you. So I assume whatever I was doing in Vietnam, you know, everybody else in the infantry was doing as well. Uh, I don't know that I had it any tougher, any better. I haven't figured out what a share is yet. So, so uh, well, on behalf of myself and uh, Ball State and the Cantini. Foundation, we'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for coming in today and sharing your experience with us. Glad to do what I can for, for people to understand what, what, what's not on the news but what really, really goes on. And uh, probably the biggest questions and feelings that I wrestle with today is, is that bonding between the infantry and the medic and the, and the bonding between the, the infantrymen. It's just, the grunts. You know, it's, it's been said that we we fought for one another in Vietnam. And that's probably the truest statement that I've heard come out of Vietnam. And we did. It was all about each other. There was the mission, okay? But it, it, it shared equally with, with covering everybody's back. I uh, never hesitated in a thought for a moment Okay, that uh, if someone could help me, they would. Okay. And that's the way I treated them. And uh, those are where most of the memories and the pains are, is, is, is among the grunts, you know. Uh, we were all grunts. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.